from Dave Smalls, Jack 60 Lanes in Jackson, Michigan. This is the PBA 50 Dave Smalls Jack's 60 Classic. Good evening, everyone. I am Phil Brylo. With me again, Tom Carter. Every week. And, Tom, it was an exciting position. Around. We had no idea who our top five was going to be. We even had to have a roll-off to determine a couple of spots in that top five. Exactly, but we got a great top five. The first match is awesome because it's between Joel Carlson and Ron Moore, who tied in Trenton, Missouri at two, or Trenton, New Jersey, at 279 apiece, had a roll-off, and Carlson ended up winning that. So that's a rematch. That next match going to Hall of Famer? Doug Kent, that's going to be a fantastic match, the high hard one. Then after that, we got Charlie Tapp, who won here, I believe it was in 2005. On the and senior tour, yes, indeed. It, and then our title match, who is a high roller favorite. He bowled all of them. He's got tour titles, Brian Kresser. And he shot a huge game in the position round, I believe. Yeah, that, 278 to get out of the position round. He vaulted from third to first. And now it's a matter of waiting in the wings. That's always the toughest thing sometimes. Just because you're in that number one seed doesn't mean you're locked to win that tournament. Yeah, that hour and 10-minute wait to bowl, that, that's tough. But he's been there before. He knows what to do. And he's got a shot that really nobody else has got. He's using a ball they never planned on using. And he's got a look that I think that nobody has. He could be the favorite to win. Yeah, John Weber making the final announcements, getting ready for our opening match. Let's get to the lanes as practice finishes up. And we'll be underway with the step ladder final. And John Weber kind of going a little old school, up close and personal with the crowd tonight. Nice to see and nice crowd here for the first time being back in Jackson, Michigan in quite a long time. 2005, as you mentioned, Tom, last time we were here with Charlie Tapp taking a title. Oh, we, we've got some stories about 2005, the last time we were here. Believe it or not, my wife was a member of the PBA 50 Tour at that time, and she made the cut here to match play with the top 32. So I have to say so did I, but I had to shoot 300 to beat her to get to the match play. <laughs> <laughs> did she forgive you quickly? No. We talk about that quite often. <laughs> Well, here's a couple of guys with uh, no forgiveness on their mind, no doubt about that, getting into this match. And as you mentioned, who can – I mean, to this, shoot 279 in the championship match like Ron Moore did with the front nine and lose, that's still got to dwell in the back. Well, Joel Ron's Carlson mind. struck out the 10th to make it 279. Then it was a one-ball roll-off, and Joel struck to win his very first title in Trenton, New Jersey. It was an absolute unbelievable match. Very, obviously, exciting because you don't see something like that all the time. And Carlson – I mean, the number of strikes he threw in New Jersey and with the title, but the number of strikes he's thrown here already this week, had the front 10 day one for a 289 game and decided, I'm starting day two off with a bang, and he started with a perfect game yesterday. Yeah, there were only 300, three 300 shot, and his was one of them. This pattern, 37 feet, 25 mils of oil, is very conducive to his game because he gets to throw that, <coughs> what we kind of call the high hard one, and he can play straighter up the outside and keep the ball in play. So the opening frame spare for Carlson and Ron Moore stepping up as the five seed. Ron Moore, I said it last week, it's again this week, he's like the ever ready bunny. This is the fifth show in a row that he has made. And he he's a super senior. It's not like he's one of the young 50 PBA guys. He's 63, I think. He's Guy's amazing. So I talked to him. I said, so, you getting tired yet? We only got two more tournaments left. We got the PBA 60 right after this and another PBA 60. Two more tournaments left on our swing. And he goes, yeah, I only did 600 sit-ups today <laughs> and 150 push-ups. He goes, I took it easy today, and I plan on taking tomorrow off. You know, one thing you mentioned about this 37-foot pattern, the Johnny Petraglia, Usually you see a lot of guys around the same area for the break point down lane. You didn't see that, and we're not seeing that with this opening match with Ron Moore and Joel Carlson. Carlson playing a much tighter line. But that was – what you're seeing right there happened a lot. In the, uh, the tournament this week, it was, it was – everybody said the same thing. The first day you had bounce off the gutter, and it's 37 feet, so you think you got 23 feet of friction – and you had bounce, and every time we've redone the lanes, they got a little tighter, you had to play a little straighter, and the oil that we're using with the 25 mils, it carried down, and the back ends got tighter, 
and every day the lanes play different. What an incredible pickup that was. But the guys actually moved their break point left because they couldn't send it to where they needed to. Take or where they like to, let's put it that yeah, way. Take another look. Off the left corner and just that little bit of hook at the end for more is enough to make sure the ball took the eight pin out of that one, two, eight, ten. I, and we're here at Jack 60, 60 lanes. We didn't use all 60, but the low end of the house played totally different than the high end of the house. The low end hooked way more. I mean, those first 10 lanes, some of the guys had said that they had moved as many as 18 boards from <laughs> one end of the house to the other. And that's not, you know, for you guys out there in league, you, you know, you, you think, man, I had to move tonight. Maybe I had to move four or five boards. Out here on tour, there's times that we have to move 18, 20 boards in a set. Yep. You know, lanes just change that much. And even though this is a brand new installation here at Jack 60, there's still some characteristics in this part of the center because this center was built in three sections over the years. This being the original part that we're on right now for the championship finals. And these are brand new lanes. I mean, they're, I mean, absolutely. When we talk brand new, brand new, new, new. <laughs> Take another look here at Joel Carlson's double. You see that little bit of the bent elbow at the top of the swing. Well, you know, Joel, if if anybody got to watch flow bowling on the match in Trenton, New Jersey, he was throwing a phase two, and he was throwing it extremely firm. This week, since the oil carried down, he's throwing that idle. It's a solid ball pinned down, so it's symmetrical. But he, he's what they're trying to do is control the back end, but he had to slow the ball down. So it actually turned the corner. Ron Moore just got that one to turn the corner just enough. You could see him staring that one down. He wasn't sure if he was going to be even enough in the pocket to take the seven out. And well, he, tickled he, it down. he got it clear out to the two board, which is typically on this pattern has been way too far. But, you know, we're, again, we're bowling on a brand new fresh oil pattern. They just re-oiled the lanes. So Ron Moore looking for his second title in the last three tournaments as the last time we visited a Dave Small Center, he's Championship throwing, Lanes, he was the titleist there. Yeah, and he's throwing a, a halo pearl, pin up above the ring finger, mass pretty tight. So he's counting on that ball since the pin is closer to his axis to pick up a little bit of a roll, and it's not real close to his axis, but it's close enough that he can pick up a, a roll and that ball reads the friction, but that's seven ten. Oh. That's the problem. you got a guy throwing a pin down ball, and they got now symmetrical, and the guy throwing a pin up ball. Watch the replay on this. Watch the six pin lay in the flat gutter and block that head pin from taking the ten down. Look at it. six falls what? flat, ten doesn't get there. Pin up ball went a little bit longer down the lane. Didn't quite make that turn on the back end. Now, for the most part, pin up balls give you a little bit more back end. But when we've got 25 mils of oil, and it, these guys had 15 minutes of practice, that oil carries down, and if the ball doesn't make the turn on the back end that pin-up ball might give you a little bit of an issue. And we've got some different layouts from the other guys coming up. Lots of changes in surface, or, or I mean, between finishing the position round. Do you see any of the guys change the surface on the bowling balls? Because once again, fresh application before these guys start to practice on the step line. That would be Brian Kretzer. Okay. He changed some surface. He actually brought a ball in he didn't even plan on using and wasn't going to use, but he threw it and he didn't like it, and he had a little surface, threw it, didn't like it, added some more surface, threw it and looked pretty good, added some more surface, he's tournament leader. Carlson. Now his ball outside, third, fourth board, and that easy move to the pocket, different than what Way Ron different doing. ball motion than what Ron's trying to create. He's creating down and a, <laughs> a let's call it a merge. Sure. His ball is merging <laughs> to the pocket where Ron is actually creating, trying to hook to the pocket. Yeah, I mean, that ball, I said third, fourth, fifth board, but that was actually around five, six, seven when we saw the replay angle. And you can see Carlson's ball right there, that pin down. Yep. CG kicked out. Just a real smooth ball, solid, so you're not looking for a bunch of snap on the back end. So this is, we got one guy throwing a solid, pin down, creating smooth reaction. Oh. We have one guy throwing a pin up pearl, trying to create snap reaction. Nap time for the 10 pin as it gets rid of bed bedtime story by the head pin. It falls asleep here in the fifth frame. Hopefully that 10 pin doesn't have nightmares after that story. Anytime you can control the back end. Look at that leverage right there. Knee bend, chest over the, the quad. 
not bent forward, not losing leverage on the ball. And Ron Moore right now down by 32. Still has five frames remaining. There's time. He's crossing like 11 and took, took that out to La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> One, two down the lane. Yeah, and you just watch that ball. It makes that initial sharp motion and then just the end over end of rest of the way of the pocket. You know, all of us, I think, and, and for most players, they like to see that really snap on the back end where it looks like somebody kicked it. But that can get you into so much trouble if you can't repeat. A little bit slow, it's right through the face, a little bit fast, 2 8 10. That needs some help. Yeah, you can just see a lag right there. Almost got the roll on the two. but it, That one didn't get out as far as the last one because he got the last one out literally to 1 2. That looked like 2 3 down lane. And he has wasted no time to pick up a spare ball to pick this up. Well, Ron Moore, I think this pretty much assures Moore even before the two PBA 60 events. Oh, he is going to be player of the year PBA for the PBA 60 yeah. player of the year for the fourth year in a row. It, Ron is an incredible player. He's got such great focus. His ball, it, we all talk about it out here because we're all jealous. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for the fact that it makes no difference if he hits a little bit light, a little bit heavy. He has got such great pin carry because of his role. Carlson, along with that title he won in the Hamilton Lanes and Entertainment Center Open earlier this year, has a PBA regional title to his credit. And once again, it's not about how many boards you cover. It's what that ball does the last five feet. Well, the greatest bowler, the GOAT, that some people call Walter Ray, has obviously made a career out of keeping the ball in front of him and not looping the whole lane. Um, there's something to be said for that. Yeah. We all like to see the ball hook, but it depends on the pattern. The pattern dictates where you should play. You don't really dictate to the pattern. And so many young people, they go, oh, I got a lot of revs. I can overpower this. That's, that's a recipe for suicide. Oh, that's got to hold. Wow, I thought it had to hold, and it just did nothing the last five feet. That's because it was in two more. There, it, okay. it didn't see the friction down lane. Not that there's a ton of friction down lane. But that ball, you can see it. It never went through to hit like the 8-9. It backed up now, when it hit. Did it take a lot of time for the oil to transition into the back part of the lane this week? Was it relatively quick as compared to the past weeks? How about at the end of 10 minutes of practice, it had transitioned? Wow. So then you're getting hook up front and tight back ends. Exactly. Okay. The lanes uh, for the last couple of weeks seem to have been doing the same thing. The fronts go away, which means the ball's going to hook early. There's enough oil in the mid lane. It ends up carrying down the lane, so the ball is not recovering on the back end. And so now you've got to have the right ball speed to, to get it through the front and enough hand to make the ball turn the corner on the back end. Ron Moore just trying to start striking soon doesn't do it. You mentioned, Tom, about, the, about needing the ball to get through the front part of the lane, turn on the back. There's guys like Harry Sullins and, and Ryan Schaefer that are really good at that, and they've had good weeks but not great weeks. Ryan's made a couple of shows over the last month. Uh, why didn't they show better here other than maybe just didn't match up right with some of the Well, they didn't match up, obviously, with that kind of a spin because their axis is way different, so their ball looks like it's spinning. So getting it through the front shouldn't have been that much of a problem, but yeah. when you've got that oil down lane, now you've got to make it turn the corner. And they could hit the pocket, but getting the ball to go through the pins – I mean, the big thing out here, and we always talk about being adaptable, and some people can change their axis, the way the ball rolls. And if you can do that when the patterns change as much as these change, you have a chance to get the ball to go through the pins the right way. Moore gets it to go through the right way on that shot. It's not out of it yet. still a possible 217. But he's shaking his head. He, he didn't really like that. But actually, a lot of half pocket hits in this center carried very well. That was one thing talking to Dave Small earlier in the week. He goes, I think this is my best carrying center that I have. And there has been a 900 bold in the center. It was bold uh, about uh, 19 years ago. But, I mean, characteristics of carries seem to go on uh, for years and years. And Carlson right back carrying after that pocket 710. Yeah. Well, he's just actually rolling the ball and letting the lane take the ball to the pocket. He's not, like, trying to overhook it. But... If you look at that follow-through, he's dead up the back of the ball, getting the ball to roll as heavy 
is possible. If you go around the ball and you kind of thumb down it a little bit, that ball is going to squirt through the front part and really never read the back part of the lane where you need it to read. So basically here, marked by Carlson, and it's pretty much going to be match over unless Moore strikes out, and then that would force Carlson to mark in the Yeah, tent. Ron Moore, if he strikes all the way out, is shooting 217. If he strikes here, ooh, spare, 86.06. And, and, and we've seen, yeah, we've seen Carlson be a little iffy on some spares today. Chopped the 6.10 in, in the position round that dropped him back a couple of spots in the standings. He really needs a spare because Ron could strike out and take this match. And that little extra bit of patience and that little extra bit of mental focus right now necessary for Carlson. Dead on you know, it, it, it's funny, his demeanor, since he is one, is totally different because now he has confidence. He knows he belongs out here. He knows he can win. And it's just a much more calming effect, trying to keep his mind slow. And he's done a fantastic job of it. He's got through that first title, and that's the hardest one to win is the first one. Yeah. Mandatory strike mode for more. Gets the 10 to go. We got the one in the ninth, strike out the 10th, 217. And that would force Carlson to mark. As Carlson, if you were to go nine miss in the 10th frame, it would be at 214. If you watch Ron's ball like there, it, it, <coughs> I think we said it five weeks in a row. Yeah. It hooks <laughs> <laughs> and it sets. It never really goes anywhere else. It just hooks sets. It never continues sideways like a lot of people like to see their ball do. Is there some conditions where a roll like that for Moore could be very detrimental to his game? Are there any conditions out there that it could, it could hinder short patterns well, really did, long? I, really long patterns, I would think, that would be tough trying to get it to set up at the right point. Because shorter patterns, you know that the ball is going to read sooner, so you can get that hook set. Okay. That long pattern, if it gets too long, it's, it's hard to get. You don't have that much transition time. If you have a 45, 48, 50 foot pattern, I mean, there's 10 feet left. Hook set's tough. A few weeks back, Ron Moore finished fourth in the South Shore Open, and he just missed the step ladder at the USBC Senior Masters in his current hometown of Las Vegas. We were talking, he just missed the show on the Senior Masters and the Super Senior Masters. So technically, he could almost have seven top fives in a row coming into today. Uh, I mean, you can't he's, let this get away from him right here. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. This, this is where he needs all the pins. You know, he can't make a bad shot on four through the center, you know, some bizarre shot because he needs everything here to make Carlson step up to the plate. Yeah, and when you're a two-time PBA 50 player of the year to go with this now four-time PBA 60 player of the year, you're making clutch shots at clutch times. This is why he's a Hall of Famer. Uh-oh. And that changes this up quite a bit. Did I just say you shouldn't be doing something like that? You need all the pins you can get? Nine on the first ball is a winner for Carlson. Never yeah. always easy for nine on the first ball because you're thinking strike. Well, when you say all you need is nine, that's that's like death right there. Well, that's the wrong mindset to walk up on the lane with. All, oh. If he's walking up right now with all he needs is nine, he's going to probably find himself in trouble. He needs to throw this like he needs this strike to win. He needs to stay aggressive, and that's the hardest thing. Look at his fingers. He's got them taped together. That's pretty unique. You know why that is? So he can get his hand through the ball a little better. And there's a win. Job's done. Joel, Joel Carlson is going to go on to meet Doug Kent, another Hall of Famer who throws the ball pretty much exactly the same way he does, except for way harder. And after this match is done, I got a question I'm going to ask you going into our match between okay. Kent and, and Carlson and just the styles and, and lane play that could make for a pretty interesting second match. So we're going to let Carlson finish this match, and we'll come back with Kent versus Carlson in just a couple of minutes. All 
All right, Tom. So we've got Joel Carlson coming off 236 to 213 win over Ron Moore. Now he's got Doug Kent. He's already bowled him once in the last hour. Right. We had the roll off for third and fourth. Kent came out on top. And I thought I saw during the practice session for Kent, it kind of, you know, they each had five minutes of practice. And all of a sudden, Lane's got a little squirrely at first for Joel Carlson. Carlson right. responded. He came close to coming back and winning the match. He's throwing a bunch of strikes in the middle. Could what Doug Kent does now here in practice really mess with Joel Carlson? Because Carlson's just got to sit on the sidelines until he throws his first shot. I personally think that the oil is going to carry down a little bit more, okay. and depending on how he plays them. Joel's been throwing pin down stuff. He's actually the only guy on the show throwing pin down stuff. He's throwing pin up stuff, so if the oil carries down, that break point's going to become tougher to hit, just okay. precise. So it's going to be a very interesting match. Obviously, Doug Kent, a Hall of Famer, is a great player. But when you're throwing pin up stuff and you got oil that's always carrying down the lane, that's changing your break point. And when that changes, now we've got to change some ball speeds to create the same angle. Could be a tough match. And is going to another piece of equipment an option for Carlson oh, right now? I mean, I think out of the Joel's games. going to stay this in, in the same boat. Okay. I think Doug <laughs> might change some equipment. Well, we'll have to wait here. we got a few more practice shot, shots coming up for Doug Kent, and we're going to have that second step ladder match here from Dave Smalls, Jack 60 in Jackson, Michigan, and the PBA 50, Dave Smalls, Jack's 60 Classic. That was a mouthful. It is always. It is. <laughs> and John Weber letting the crowd know. Doug Kent, surprisingly, opting to go first in this match as the higher seed. Is it because Carlson struck out, you know, when he needed to on, on, on that right lane? He wants to move to the left lane for the 10th frame? What do you think? Well, there, there, obviously there's two options. Yeah, that's okay. one option. Other than that, he, he has a better shot on the other lane, <laughs> you know. And you know, we got guys throwing two totally different kinds of balls, pins up, pins down. Doug throwing a pearl, that emerald pearl pin up. But, you know, Doug – such a big, strong guy. And he looks like he should have been a bouncer somewhere. Uh, just really firm, down and in. But you're, the shape of the ball that you just seen there is the same thing that Carlson's doing. They're trying to keep the ball down and in and in play. And obviously Doug can do it better with a, a pearl ball than something that's solid. For people that are new to watching us on Flow Bowling, obviously Flow Sports offers all kinds of sports out there. Some people turning us on for the first time. What's the difference between that solid bowling ball that Joel's using and something with a pearlized cover, just the basics like Doug Kent's well, using? Something, I guess, easy to explain. It would be a, a solid ball. Uh, use the analogy of, let's say that it, it's kind of like snow tires on your car. It's going to have more grit. And the pearl ball is like having slicks on your car. It's going to slide farther. It doesn't have as much surface to it, so the ball is going to go down the lane easier. And technically, if a ball can get down the lane easier, it can rev faster in the oil because there's not as much friction. should give you more angle entry on the back end. But sometimes angle entry can be good, yeah. <laughs> and it can be bad, especially if it's too much. Right. If you, uh, you watch race cars, it puddles on those slicks. Those could be problematic, and all of a sudden they get grip, and all of a sudden the car finally turns. Right. Usually it's an accident. <laughs> the guys out here, for the most part, I mean, you look at his leverage, which is absolutely fantastic, and Doug is the same way. That's why they're getting their ball to react as well. The ball is really not reading the front part of the lane. We've talked about it all week, that the lanes are starting to hook earlier, and if the better your leverage is where your, your torso your, your shoulders are right above your quads as you're releasing the ball. You get that ball through the front part of the lane much easier. When you bend too far forward at the foul line, two things tend to happen. Your hand goes around the ball, the thumb goes down, the ball hooks early, never reads the back end. And right there, a little late reading the back end for Kent as the five got into the seven pin zone, did a hop, skip, and a jump, and got stopped by the head pin well, coming off the sideboard. This is the part of throwing a pearl ball compared to that dull ball. That pearl ball is going to, and with his great speed, I mean, like I said, he's a big guy. He's, what, 6'3"? Yeah. You know, 230. I mean, he's solid, and, and he throws it really firm. I mean, off his hand, I mean, that ball's 17 mile an hour off his hand. I mean, down lane, which means it's 20 mile an hour off his hand. And so that ball's getting down there easily. So if he, 
that ball does not read or slow down enough. We talk about it reading the lane. And the only way a ball reads the lane, it has to slow down to create friction. If it doesn't create the right amount of friction to turn the corner on the back end, that ball's not going through the pins. Doug Kent, 10 career PBA Tour titles, yet to get his first victory out here. On the PBA 50 Tour, his best career finish came at the Dave Smalls Championship Lanes Classic a couple events ago where he finished in third. If you, that yeah. ball almost looked like, hate to interrupt you, but that ball yeah. almost looked like he, I hate to say it, kind of hit up on it. It was lofted out on the lane. It went up onto the lane, which made it skid even a little bit farther instead of getting that ball right into the lane so it can read. He stared that one down a little differently too, like, okay, I got back, uh, and it didn't go down. Oh, that could have picked up 7-10 yeah, right there. there. we go. And we had a 7-10 pickup this week. Uh, Steve, Steve Jaros. We had a couple interesting spare conversions that you can go back after the event is done and watch on the homepage at flowbowling.com. Steve Jaros is 7-10, and Michael Haugen Jr. making the 2A-10 left-handed, which is legal in PBA competition. We can use both hands in PBA, not so much in the USBC. Carlson looking for the front three. And that was a little farther right, down, you know, set down and in the mid lane. That ball got farther right than I believe that was intended. So that was not as down the lane as he's been playing. The, the one thing that was interesting to me for Carlson was watching that six pin basically. The ball hit the six pin and basically just barely tipped it over. Is that deflection he's going to have to worry about his ball roll or his carry down now? No, no. Well, it could be carry down, but I, personally I just think that he missed that shot, and he missed that spare, which is not a thing that you want to do against a Hall of Famer. Doug Kent will probably take advantage of this next shot. And he's playing the left side of the lane on that spare, and it's only a 37-foot pattern, so when that ball gets to the left and gets to that dry, it accelerates towards that left gutter. It's it's funny. Guys that were sending the ball right kept saying, we, we, we've already said it, talking about carry down and the ball not making the corner. But when you shot across lane, especially going towards the left side of the lane, there seemed to be plenty of friction and the ball hooked away from your uh, your intended target. Back on line. And the six leans on the 10. I, it's just amazing to watch him and his demeanor is so calm. Yeah. He's learned to slow down his mind and just keep it in play instead of being nervous. Even though he won that title, mm -hmm. it looked like he was wound up like an eight-day clock. One thing with Doug Kent, I look at how far he can spread that index finger as compared to the rest of his grip. I'd have to dislocate my index finger to get it spread that wide. Well, there's one other player, unfortunately, that just lost that does the same thing. If you watch Ron Moore, his is spread, and there's so much pressure on that the tip of his index. And if you watch the great, the, the great Johnny Petragli, it's the same way. Okay. On the left side... That index is spread, and there is pressure on that index finger to keep that wrist firm through the shot. So, Kent, do you just take the count here? You got to. You got. You, this is still early in the match. You, if this was the 10th frame and it was bet all, yeah, you got to go for it. But right now, give me those three pins. Because right now, with those three pins, he's going to find himself down in this match by 17, by 13, pardon me. And But we're only in the fourth frame. There is a lot of time left to play. I just, uh, that ball he's throwing is a long ball. And normally, and you would think, okay, it's only 37 feet. That ball should react more than it is. But you can see by watching, 37 feet, that ball's not really coming off the pattern like somebody kicked it. It's getting down the lane pretty clean. Once again, Kent using that little bit of loft to try to combat the pattern. Six gets the 10 down before that, the head pick can do the job. <laughs> that was a, a, a lazy 10, but he got it out of there. Watch that replay. Watch that six rattle and roll. And that's why you see these senior players worried about keeping the ball speed up because things like that, a mile an hour slower ball speed, and that head pin doesn't get back across, mm -hmm. and that six definitely doesn't come out of the flat cover. Another thing, you look at Joel Carson. He's got those fingers taped where his finger – his pinky is on the ball, which creates a little bit more roll, where Doug has his pinky tucked, and that creates a little more skid down lane and technically kind of gives you a little bit more back end if everything works out the right way. So 
Doug throwing a pearl ball with his pinky tucked and with his speed is going to get down the lane farther. So he's got to make sure that his leverage is great to make that ball turn the corner. Joel's got to try to keep in check so that he doesn't get too fast because his natural ball speed is flaming. He likes to throw it hard. And if he gets firm, he's never going to give a ball a chance to turn the corner. Can't afford to let another single pin get away from him, and he doesn't with the spare. So Carlson up 13, half a match remaining. And you just see the pensive look right there. What's he going to have to do on that right lane to carry next time he's up? Is he going to have to move maybe back right? Is the carry down that much of an issue right now, Tom? Uh, well, the carry down is this week has always been an issue. Okay. But I think for him is, is ball speed. You know, granted, moving right is going to be an option, but you can also move right and the ball not read at all. I personally think that he's got to control his ball speed a little bit better. Yeah, that Good. one right here, watch the replay. It just doesn't do anything down lane. It's no, he's crazy. getting a little bit farther right than he was getting it in the first match. Okay. And so I, we're talking about fresh oil. So that little track that they developed through practice and everything, and he, if he doesn't play it, he doesn't have any friction. And the polyester at the two pin, no problem. Doug is pretty much, if, if he just calms down, he, he's got this match in hand, but he just can't not overthrow the ball. Doug Kent, former player of the year on the Go Bowling PBA Tour back in the 06-07 season when he took down the PBA World Championship and the USBC Masters in the same season. That was a fantastic shot. Last week when he made the show and we talked about it, he, he had a back issue. He had really hurt his back, and he was walking all bent over but managed to actually fight through it and, yep. and bowl well. And this week, yeah, he's way better. Obviously, he's got the back issue fixed because – he looks more like Doug Kent. Yeah, gutted his way through the first two step ladder matches with a win before finally getting pumped out in a third place finish at the Dave Smalls Championship Lanes Classic. And he had to gut his way through that match play round as well with that back injury. That happened very early in that round. He was walking all bent over, and, and his brother-in-law, Parker, <laughs> was saying, well, at least we know what he looks like when he gets 80 because that's the way he's going to be walking. <laughs> And there you see Kent. Now, these guys obviously can still throw with a little bit of fire behind it. As players get older, for our fans watching at home, what's more important for them to work on, ball speed or revolutions? Ball speed. The balls are so aggressive today that they're going to slow down automatically. And if you don't have enough speed to get the ball down the lane, you can buy every ball on the wall, and it's not going to make any difference. There's so much friction on the lane. The ball is going to slow down and stop. So working on your ball speed is going to be a key factor as you get older. You know, And the way you work on your ball speed is try to keep your foot speed going. The faster your feet go, the faster your arm swing should go. Just like when you used to run, your arms went with your feet. You know, you got to keep your feet going. And everybody always says, well, i got to slow my feet down. I Personally, I always believe that there's no such thing as a fast footwork. There is such a thing as a slow arm swing. People tend to want to decelerate just as they release the balls to make sure they hit the target. And then they give the ball too much time to read the lane, and it's all bad. Got to stay aggressive. And you saw that with Carlson right there. He gets the lead back in this match temporarily by two pins. With that double in the seventh and eighth frames, take another look. Joel's got a possible 236 if he can finish it out. Boy, sometimes when you watch somebody go to some of these high school meets, you see some of the kids sometimes try to play patterns, and you just want to go, watch these guys right now. It's not about how many boards you cover. It's no. about where you get that ball to roll and smash on the lane. It's great that you have a lot of revs. And I tell young people all the time, I wish I had that many revs. But if you can have that many revs and keep it in a tighter line, do you know how much energy you have when the ball hits the pocket? Yeah. That ball expels energy as it goes out and comes back in. And if you can learn to tighten up that line and keep all those revs, the world is yours. <laughs> 244 the max now for Kent, 236 the max for Carlson. 
And it's interesting once again that Kent decided he wanted to finish this match last because he may have to step up with a pressure pack situation in the 10th frame. We've seen Carlson put strikes in bunches. The only problem with that is if he gets pumped up because he has natural ball speed and he throws that right through the break point, no good. That ball seemed to hit the lane and insta move like two boards to the left. Watch the replay. Like it caught friction. As soon as it hit on the lane, it just kind of grabbed it and stopped. Okay, so good point. When the ball goes into the lane like a plane landing on a runway, it automatically skids farther down the lane because it doesn't go. When you actually, we call it hit up on the ball, and it goes up and into the lane, it gets through that oil gets through the lane surface, and it's going to grab sooner, and it's, you're going to make it jump quicker, Okay. you know? Yeah, because that ball jumped and then hit oil and just kind of wiggled, it, not, not wiggled at the pocket, but it didn't hit with all the effectiveness he had prior. Soon as the ball starts losing energy, it's losing power, okay. right? You know, he, the idea is to get the ball as, as cleanly down the lane as possible with as many rotations as you can so it has energy going through the pocket. You don't want a ton of reflection. You want it to drive through the pocket. And if the lane was long enough, every ball would come to a stop, right? It would slow down. And if that ball in hits too much friction and starts slowing down too soon, oh. that's all bad. Look at that trip four forward. Wow. And you talk about a huge shot there because that's a three-pin advantage and then possibly more for Carlson. He can make Kent's 10th frame a moot point. See, that was much better than the shots before where he was way outside. He was more down the lane right around 10 and didn't give the ball away. He's in that what we call, I like to call a tube. It's like a four or five board area wide all the way down the lane. And if you can keep that ball in the tube and not get too far out of it, your carry percentage is going to be pretty good, especially on the patterns that we've been playing on. Strike nine miss for Carlson in the 10th frame would be 224 and enough for a win. And he wasn't sure. Hop, skip, and a jump. jump. There you go, baby. That's an Olympic event. Send that ten pin to the or send that head pin to the Olympics next time around. Hop, skip, jump, and down goes the ten. See, he kept that ball tighter again. We're talking about energy. Energy at the pins make them dance. You have round objects hitting other round objects, and the idea is if you can keep those balls, those pins rather, on the deck and they're rolling around, they got a chance to hit something else. Everybody like, I want 10 in a pit. No, I kind of want my pins hitting something else. Nine is enough here for Carlson. Because that would give him 224. Most for That's every bit of nine. <laughs> How about 10? <laughs> if we could overlay the last two shots with that head pin coming back across, they're pretty darn close. Right. Once again, you watch that head pin do the damage on the 10. You know, One, two, three, down. His style right now is perfect. He's dead at the line. He's just rock solid. There's no wavering. He's through it. Body position is fantastic. All right, to keep the triple kit hopes alive, because that's the last thing he's worried about right now, but it is another 236 game, for Carlson. Game, set, match, and we're on to bowling another incredible player, Charlie Tapp. So we're going to let... Doug Kent finishes 10th frame here. And we're going to talk to Josh Solomon, general manager here at Jack 60, in just a moment. So Doug Kent finishes off with a 213, not enough against Joel Carlson's 236, and Carlson's going to advance to the next match against Charlie Tapp. Before we get into that next match, joining me in the booth, Josh Solomon from here at Jack 60 General Manager. And Josh, thanks for the hospitality all week long, and uh, boy, for your first PBA 50 event, you guys have done a great job. Of course, you have a great mentor with Dave Small, no doubt about that, but 
How are you feeling right now? You're only halfway through this run. Man, I'm uh, <laughs> not going to lie. I'm still a little nervous. Okay. Uh, it's, um, it's a privilege and an honor for me to be able to host these guys. I grew up watching them on TV, and uh, I just I can't be happier. This is a dream come true, and without Mr. Small, uh, I wouldn't be able to do this. And uh, it's exciting. Um, I loved watching all the bowling this week. It was awesome. These guys throw it so good and make it look so easy. It was it was amazing. You know, and one of the neat things last night was is that you run a weekly sweeper here, and because of the format of the tournament, there's time for the fans to come in and watch the players during the day. And you had the sweeper last night, and there were f almost 50 people here for a, a weekly sweeper, and they decided they wanted the challenge of bowling on this PBA pattern. I thought that was pretty awesome. It, I mean, it, it was it was neat. It was it was fun. Uh, I actually took the time to go bowl for once, and uh, um. Uh, my, uh, my physical game wasn't quite there to perform, but I had a blast, and I know that all the guys that came out and ladies uh, just had fun. They, you know, they got to see what these guys were seeing, and it was, uh, it was an experience for everybody. And the remodel here is just absolutely spectacular. I mean, you look out a history of Jackson over the mask units here, and it, it, what you guys do here is, is pretty incredible when you guys, you and Dave, uh, you know, put your heads together and make a, a great center like this. And I know you're... you're your league bowlers are really looking forward to coming back in the fall and uh, experiencing this on their own. Yeah, it was, um, you know, a year ago this all started. And, you know, when we started, it was supposed to be, we had 60 days until league season to get the projects done. Okay. And then the projects kept building and building <laughs> and building. And uh, Dave gave us the opportunity to do a lot of really, really exciting things here. Uh, new lane surface, brand new scoring from Cubica. Um, I can't thank Cubica and Brunswick enough for the lanes and the scoring. And uh, just the upgrades that, you know, a place like this really deserved. And I... I've had a blast doing all of it and learning it. Um, you, uh, I recently got married, and my best man in his speech said we all knew that he'd run a bowling center someday. <laughs> and you've done a great job doing it, and I am looking forward to getting to spend my company uh, three more days with you here. And uh, You have a great staff you've brought on board, and we appreciate everything you've done so far, and we know it's going to be a great rest of the week here at yeah. Jack 60. I, I, I can't do it without them. I have to thank my staff. They are absolutely amazing. Um, my, my managers have put in the hours to get this to where it is. Uh, Brady Collip, Jake Bushinsky, and Eric Beardsley have done it. And the rest of my staff have done what they needed to do to make sure that you guys were taken care of. And uh, I couldn't be prouder. Yeah, if you get in the area of Jackson, Michigan, Jack 60, stop by, check it out, have some of the great food here, have a beverage, and, and bowl a game or two. Why not? Bowl where there's been plenty of history made on the PBA Tour, and we're going to make some more tonight. Josh, thanks for your time. appreciate it. And we're going to be back with that semifinal match in just a moment. And here we go, Charlie Tapp, Joel Carlson. Tapp as the higher seed defers to Carlson to start first to finish last. And Carlson's had both sides of that equation in two matches. Either side, he's shot 236 with a win. I don't, I don't think that's the issue. He's got both lanes pretty wired. In the break, I had a chance to talk to Ron Moore. And Ron was saying, he goes, this pair is an arrow and a half tighter than anything we played on. Wow. He goes, I had to ball up. And I still couldn't. He goes, I missed left, and the ball still almost didn't hit the head pin. He goes, it's amazing how tight this pair is. Is it so, just from how they developed it in the 15 minutes of practice? It, it could be. I mean, this earlier uh, I was watching Parker, and in practice he had a great shot for 10 minutes. Let's say for nine minutes. Last minute was a little questionable. Lights come on, and it was like the ball never wrinkled. So it – <laughs> oh, that, there's a senior messenger right there. That's normally what we get is that slow roller. Oh. Watch the head pin fall. Takes two doses of Geritol and makes it the rest yeah, of the way. Yes, yeah, slow. It's a good thing we have slow racks. You know, that makes us seniors feel good. And we got a strike a piece here to start off the semifinal match. Brian Kretzer waiting in the wings for this winner. And an interesting point right now. Uh, we thought we'd maybe have a record this week. Walter Ray Williams was bowling. Maybe he could have won his 15th title. Charlie Tapp, if he wins tonight, becomes the oldest to win a PBA 50 tour event. That event, that uh, record held right now by James Brenner after winning the Epicenter Classic in 2006. So we could see some history tonight out of Charlie Tapp. James, Jim Brenner, what a prince of a guy. I, I hate to say I won my first regional title off of Jim Brenner in a one ball roll off and fortunately we've lost Jim but what a great person I think that guy was 
loved by everybody. Yeah. He just and so smooth. You never heard the ball hit the <laughs> lane when Jim was bowling. So Tap going to switch to the polyester. To He's got his lane. pinky in. He he went to that. He said he needed a little bit more strength to hang on to the ball. Happens to us old people. Just just on the spare ball or on all, <laughs> all of them. equipment? Okay. Yep, all of them. That was an unfortunate missed error right there. If somebody's at home, they just heard that and they go, "Oh, my my wrist is a little weak. I need to, drill, you know, I need, should I get a pinky hole?" What do you just go to your pro shop and go, "I need a pinky hole," or is yeah, that going to require exactly. a whole new no, measurement? No, no. Okay. You just it should be re very very easy for your pro shop to add a pinky hole, and, and a lot of players, believe it or not, have it. it. It doesn't really take any revs off the ball. It does a little bit, but not enough to really, I don't think, worry about. But the big thing is it allows you to strengthen your wrist so that you don't have as much floppiness in your wrist because, you know, well, I need a wristband or something. It, you got one more finger in the ball, and the pinky actually helps you firm up your wrist a little bit. Don't okay. put your index finger in the ball. That's a bad idea okay. because you will lose all your revs if you drill a hole for your <laughs> index finger. That's why you see, as you said before, so many players spread the index finger right. and you don't you, see a lot of spread pinkies. You, you need that finger to push around the index finger we're talking about to push around the ball to create axis rotation. When you, The pinky just helps you hang on to it a little bit more. So Carlson tickles the 10 down, takes the early 12 pin advantage in the match. And everybody's got the chamois nowadays. Best thing they have to take the oil off the ball. Those things are unbelievable. They actually pull the oil off the ball where a towel just kind of like smears it around. These new chamois, they got leather on them, and it literally pulls the oil off the ball. And the six does the jab on the ten. He is really keeping his lines in front of him. He's not giving it away hardly at all. That's what we talked about, Ron. His game and mine are... Not that we're similar, but <laughs> the ball is right off of our hand, and we like. And you would think on 37 feet, you could throw it to the right, and the ball is going to bounce back. But unfortunately, with 25 mils of oil on 37 feet, and the way that the pattern is built, the oil, unfortunately, not a lot in the front ends up down the lane, and the lint back end gets tighter and tighter. 13 years since Charlie Tapp's seen the winner's circle back in the 2006 Senior Decatur Open. Yeah, last year in Fort Wayne at the PBA 60, uh, Charlie and I bowled each other. I, I just won a match, 279 to 277. I had to bowl Charlie, and I shot 289. I thought I was going to win, and he shot 300 at me. So yeah. <laughs> well, Charlie had a 300 to close out match play round one today, and he needed it to stay in the top eight, advance to match play round two. See, and here we're talking about layouts on balls. He's throwing a phase two. And it's pin up. Carlson is the only guy throwing a pin down ball unless Brian Kretzer comes on in the last match. That is way outside and has no chance. He's got to be happy it's just the two pin. Yeah, because that could have been a 2-8-10 real easy. That was way out. You know, Charlie being, what, 6-6, six, six, tall, lanky guy, has natural ball speed with that long arm swing. You, you can't throw it in the out of bounds and hope it comes back. <laughs> Not like that. I think Charlie really wanted to be a a comedian when he grew up because we had him for a Hall of Fame uh, speaker one time, and all he did was tell jokes. People were wondering about the tour, and Charlie was telling jokes. You know, here it was right before position round today for match play round one, and Charlie's up here in the booth, and he's having a good laugh with us and, and just being jovial, and all of a sudden, well, let's just get out there and shoot 300. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. He's so kind of happy-go-lucky. <laughs> i got to tell a story. It's funny to me. Charlie, uh, when we had that Hall of Fame banquet, he roomed it. He stayed at our house. And at that time, we had a a small dog. Uh, it was part Australian Shepherd and, and part Corgi uh, with a bad attitude. And Charlie kept wanting to pet him. And for the three days that Charlie was at the house, Buster had bit him three, 11 times. Oh, jeez. Oh. And Charlie kept saying, dogs really like me, and tried to pet him and Buster bite him. <laughs> uh, speaking of getting bit, that's a snake bit for Carlson there. Or a Rottweiler bite, take your pick. Oh, 7'10". Se yeah. It's pickable in this place. And that brings this match back to even. 
after four frames. We start the PBA 60 on Saturday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. No rest for all the old guys like Charlie and yourself. 100, 108 entries we have for the PBA 60, and God willing, a little luck and the creek don't rise. Uh, my knee holds up and I, I can play. <laughs> you know, I've ta- I, I withdrew from this tournament and didn't get to bowl it at all, hoping that my knee would heal up so I could bowl it. And I had such a great week last week. I was in fifth for a while, and... Uh, you know, after the first day, ended up in seventh. The second day, was in 15th. And going to match play, hoping that I could fight my way back to the show. We were talking about it would be great if I could get on the show and do the comment- right. commentary. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find you 50 feet of XLR cable. You'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> three and a half games, my leg gave out. It just uh, that, no good. Yeah. Once again, Char- and Charlie's not exactly a short man. Yeah, he's got to be 6'5", yeah. at least. You, know, you, you look at some of the taller players in PBA history, Steve Cook comes to mind and Charlie Tapp comes to mind as well. Steve Cook always comes to mind. He's like 6'7", mm-hmm. with one of the deepest knee bends. Yep. I use him on my coaching when people say, you know, tall guys go, well, you know, I, I, I'm tall. I can't get down the yep. line. And I, I show him Steve Cook. I go, don't give me that. Because Steve Cook was 6'7", and it had to be at least three and a quarter, you yeah. know, 275. Yeah. And a real deep knee bend, and that ball in his hand looked like a grapefruit. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can players, like, okay, Charlie's a tall guy, and a lot of people, as we get older, flexibility goes away, and the knee bend doesn't get as deep. What can you do to make up for not having as deep of a knee bend? Is there yeah. anything you can do? Biggest thing is don't worry about your knee bend, okay. because as soon as you start worrying about not being able to bend your knee, people tend to want to bend at their waist and lean forward because I can't get down with my knee anymore, so I'm going to bend my waist forward and I'm going to set the ball down. And as soon as you bend forward and your shoulders get ahead of your knees, you start losing leverage and the ball doesn't react. It's okay that the ball lands on the lane and makes that little bang. Don't worry about the bang on the lane. You're not hurting the lane. Get the ball into the lane like a plane landing on a runway. Use your height to your advantage and don't worry so much as you get older about the knee bend because People, especially tall people, really do. I, I got to set it down. I don't want to hear it go bang. And now that he goes, but my ball don't react. Well, of course it doesn't react because you've lost all your leverage. It's a tap down by two, sixth frame. Much better shot. He tried to keep it in that two, but now his ball's reacting. Here's, here we go back to pin up and pin down okay. stuff. Looked like it was in the tube. Looked like a good shot. Great speed. But as soon as it hit the dry on the back end, You've seen it move much more violent on the back end right through the face. I think Joel's got the right idea. You know, pin down, keep that back end controllable. Don't. Could, is there room for Charlie to move left in the front part of the lane and still have it ball hit hard? Because that's the other problem that we've seen. All of a sudden, you move left and the ball just isn't picking up in time. Yeah, you can move left. Okay. You better slow it down <laughs> to get it around the corner on the back end. Okay. And I think that's what you're going to see in the next match when Brian Kresser gets here. He likes to be left, and he's going to like, I think, unless I miss my guess, he's going to kind of slow loop it around. But, you know, you got to have touch for that. And, you know, Charlie and Joel have always been down and in, kind of strong players as far as this way, moving left and softening up. That might be more like their C or D game, okay. <laughs> not so much their B game. But the way this 37-foot Petraglia pair is playing, they can kind of both stay in their A games possibly if Carlson advances the championship match. It's starting to look that way right now. Well, you know, and I think the only difference, it, it might be more of a match if Charlie was throwing something pinned down where the ball didn't try to if, – if you watch that ball there on that slow motion replay – Again, I call it merging. It just kind of merged yeah. to the pocket. It didn't try to change direction real hard. You know, that change of direction really hard, again, we've said it 100 times, it's fun to watch. You know, you see guys throw it to the right and it bounces back. But, man, that can get you in so much trouble, especially when you're bowling on a tough pattern. Oh, and Carlson, no doubter on that one. At the rate he's going, he could have his second PBA title all in the same year. And we've had two players already repeat with titles. Walter Ray did it back-to-back-to-back to, back to, back to kick off the season. LeClaire did it in Monticello and Hammond. Can we finish our 2019 PBA 50 season with another two-time champion on tour? Those are the only bowlers that have more than two titles this year. Well, obviously, if you look at the, the patterns and the players that are doing it, you just switch balls yep. to something smoother. 
and he moved uh. right, it looked like, and it just didn't pick up. That really, you mentioned the bang into the lane. That right. did it there. It can't go straight in the lane. It's got to go onto the lane. There's, I guess there's a difference there. If, you, if, if I'm trying to make it sound right to the, our, our viewers, the ball's got to go onto the lane. If, like, again, a plane landing on a runway, don't, it's not a helicopter <laughs> crash into the floor, <laughs> and you're not trying to alley-oop it out on the lane. Right. You're trying to actually float it into the lane. Now you see the frustration building a bit for Charlie Tapp. Charlie, three PBA Tour titles in his career. And he's thrown, he went to a smoother ball, and that looks like an IQ Tour. Yeah. But that is also pin up even f higher than where the other one is. What, what's his logic behind that then? Trying to get more length and more back end? No. Well, I think he's, he, he went to a different ball to be smoother. Okay. But the layout being the same could cause the ball to go too long down the lane, not make the turn. If he slows up, could jump again. I, I still think it's a, a pin down game. And the only other thing that can ha happen is if, if Brian comes out here with what – and he was throwing is, – is called a label drill, which is the pin is kind of off to the right a little bit. It lets, allows the ball to read the mids a little sooner. Um, that could be the only thing that could stop Carlson. Tap two PBA regional tiles and a PBA 50 regional tile to go with his go bowling PBA tour and PBA 50 titles. Two times on the PBA 50 tour for tap. And we normally just see Charlie at these Midwest events. Doesn't do a lot of traveling. Well, he coaches college. Yep. Uh, I think he's into uh, he, he's got a like a little stock car that he races. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of things he's doing, you know. And, and to see him back out here, it's fantastic. He used to be roommates with uh, Tom Baker on the regular tour. Uh, so I, he bowled a lot of tournaments. I mean, he's been been on the tour forever, but he's got other interests now. But to see him back out here is, is fantastic. That was straight over 10, 8 down lane. Looked like it was going to snap out the 10, but not quite. Uh, six pin just decided to fall in the pit before making full contact on the 10. Charlie can go out. If he strikes out, the best Charlie can do is 188. With that spare, we just need another mark yeah. pretty much out of Joel, and he's going to be bowling for his second title this year. If you're Carlson and you get up in the 10th frame, match in hand already, don't need much of anything. Do, do you, I try another ball? Do you, do you try another ball? I mean, this one's gotten him pretty far, but it's not getting him the same scores he had the first two games. I'd say yes. Okay. Uh, you know, j just what the heck. You know, why not? Unless you can slow it down because, again, slowing it down, and I talked to him earlier, th that's nef not his A game at all. He would yeah. rather throw it hard. And so to actually stay slow and be consistent at being slow, uh, when you change your ball speeds, I, for some people that's the hardest thing in the world to do. Changing hand positions is easy. Changing ball speed and keeping consistent, oh. And there's the cover for Carlson. And now it's mandatory strike mode for Tap to get the 188. He needs all four. Yeah, he needs four strikes to get to 188. And right now, if Joel just goes nine out, he's 184. So, uh, Actually, he's 193 going nine out for Carlson. 66. Nine out, 85, 80, 95, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anything less than four strikes, and uh, Carlson, the only thing they have to worry about is a Greek church in that case. Not that we haven't seen him before. <laughs> oh. And this pattern's allowed a lot of strange things. He got that farther yeah. right. The ball never read. I just think, personally, it was the wrong layout, but that's just an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> You never know until the ball is in your own hand and you're out on you what know, they're experiencing. As right ball now. reps, what we see back here mm -hmm. and what the player sees at the foul line, for the most part, are two different things. And trying to get somebody to get what we think is the right ball in their hand can be tough sometimes. Like, no, I'm just a little off. Uh, no, it's <laughs> just a little farther than that. Is it just the different ways that you can see ball motion from a player? I mean, do some guys just – are there some guys that 
are on your staff where it's just like you go, you got to see the same thing I do. You're not seeing it. I don't know if, do? if any of us actually see the same thing, you know, because we're. Okay. I'm 20 feet back here. They're at the foul line, and I see the ball as soon as it hits the lane. They see the ball hopefully within seven to ten feet, you know, but still you miss that first couple of feet, or maybe they don't see it until 20 feet. You, you miss a lot. Mm -hmm. um, reading ball motion is the hardest thing. I know Del Ballard out here with Storm, you know, talking to his guys. I'm talking to my guys and trying to – it's a suggestion because – they got to feel it's right in their mind, in their heart that you know I'm. This is what I need to do. And if they got confidence, they can make some balls work that maybe we don't think are right. So tap max out 175. Here. He's going to be home with, going home with third place cash. But I know we're going to see Charlie in the next two events as well. Oh yeah, he'll be down at the PBA 60s. So and not a lot of rest for Charlie. His practice session tomorrow morning, and we start coverage here 4 p.m. Yeah, we practice in the morning. Yeah. This is for the super seniors. The seniors get to practice one day and start the tournament the next day. The super seniors, which are 60 and older, because seniors are only 50, right? Yeah. Super seniors have to practice at noon, then start two and a half hours later, our tournament starts. Sure. Because we are stronger. That's right. It's all the mental fortitude you guys have. All the years of experience. And a lot of the times where you guys just go, uh, I, just need, I just need two shots and I'm fine. That's it. That's it. Give me two shots on the fresh. I'll know what to do from there. Well, you would think that would be that easy. Well, Carlson, that is a different ball in his hand. So he. Well, we called that one right. Then. Yes. What's that? What, to, trying to see what that ball was in his hand here. Well, that kind of looks like an IQ tour also from my vantage point. Yeah. And that looked pretty smooth too. So you think he's staying with pin down? I would assume. Joel have a lot of stuff drilled similar, just different versions of I, well different he, balls. He's got a lot of different layouts. It's just, you know, what he did, you obviously, you know, you come out here and a lot of us bring out nine balls. And, and he's, he's even trying another one again. He just went to the bag again. He's getting another one. That's the So pin. he's going to, that's a, looks like a phase two, but that's pin up just what Charlie got through throwing. Huh. Now, I'm, he's looking at that <laughs> to create more back end. Right. But I, I'm not so sure that's going to be the right idea, but we will see in next match. Yeah, we're going to let uh, Joel finish out his last shot here. He can max out for 216. And we'll give you a little preview on the Brian Kretzer and Joel Carlson final in just a moment. So there it is. Joel Carlson puts 216 on the board against 175 for Charlie Tapp. Carlson's rode the ladder to this point. Now here comes the tough match. Championship match. Joel's been there before this year. He took home the title in New Jersey at the Hamilton Entertainment Center Open. Problem is now you've got Brian Kretzer who plays an entirely different part of the lane. Totally different Carlson game. Does. Right now, Joel is getting to play the same thing that he did in New Jersey, just at a little slower speed. Now he's got to go against Brian Kretzer, who has literally – he's a high roller player. Eh? He's used to playing a lot of different patterns. He's got a ton of hand tricks that he can do. He's going to be playing a different line and probably hoping that they opened up the lane, down lane, to create a little bit more reaction for him. It's going to be an interesting game. Are they going to cross paths at any part of the lane, mid lane down? It won't be till the, the break point. Okay. I, I don't think those two guys will hit each other until the, at the break point because – Joel's going to be going this way, and Kresser's going to be going this way. And it just I, I, with learning this game so much and the fans at home doing the same thing, it's like you think, okay, both bowlers will get to the break point, and all of a sudden it should start hooking more. That might not necessarily be the case because you said Kretzer's coming from the inside. There's probably more oil. Kretzer's going to be using the oil. He's using the same kind of a layout for the most part as Joel is, and he's using more surface so okay. he can get deeper on the lane. So he's going to be using more surface, kind of slow looping it to that break point and allowing the ball to turn the corner where I think Joel's going to stay kind of with a high hard one, yep. his A game, onto the outside. It's going to be a matter of carry. I, there's no doubt that I think that both of them are going to hit the pocket consistently. It's just who carries the best. Yeah, and both players are looking for their second career PBA 50 title. Brian Kretzer just stepping out for his practice. We're going to let Brian get his practice in, and we'll be back with that championship match from here at Dave Smalls, Jack 60, and the PBA 50, Dave Smalls, Jack 60 Classic, presented by Track. 
and John Weber making the announcement here, Tom, about Crutcher's last practice shot, and he got six shots, but they seem to take a while. Is that just to try to take Carlson out of a rhythm, maybe, or that? But he threw a lot of different balls. I, I, I think he's he's looking for a reaction. He's throwing the ball that we talked about in, in the very beginning, an hour and a half ago. Uh, but he threw uh, an IQ, the Emerald. He's throwing. Um, the X, I, he's just, he's throwing everything. Yeah. I, I think he's looking for a reaction because right now, just watching the warm-ups, he didn't have the reaction he had in match play. So Carlson will get the start. Kretzer, the higher seed, defers. And we watched Carlson throw, what, three three different balls right there at the end, or two different balls at the end? Yep. And he's back to the one that's got him to where he's at, oh. which I think is personally a good call. The others might give him a little more back end, but this is going to give him control. I'm going to kind of take control. If you can manage the pocket, you got a chance to strike. Well, you can control with the movement of your bowling ball, but the one thing that Carlson has to control, as you mentioned earlier, is that ball speed because that's what got him in trouble a bit last game. He still got 216 out of that game, but it wasn't his best thrown one of the three by far. Well, you know, heart rate might have been up a little bit. So here is a total different ball game here. Jeez. He's throwing a high road X with a real tall pin, and he's inside. Now there is a line that you haven't seen on the show. He crossed inside a fourth arrow trying to take it to 10, and that could be suicide. And when that ball found friction, it did just it hop left? I mean, that ball literally was like 22 at the arrows, eight down lane. So... That went 14 boards to the right, and then when it peeled, it peeled right back through the head yeah. pin. He left 3-6-10, which we've talked about 100 times. There's only 9,000 ways to miss it and one way to make it. Well, Kretz are making the tape adjustment, didn't like the feel, took a piece out. And he's one of those players, doesn't use that interchangeable thumb, goes over to the polyester ball. <laughs> And not the That's textbook not way to make it. <laughs> Nelson Burton wouldn't <laughs> like that shot. <laughs> He's on the board with a spare, though. And Kretzer, he'll take his time between shots. You know, we talked about this earlier that, you know, he's got an hour and a half basically almost to wait. I mean, that's got to – it would be really interesting to know, and somebody probably knows, the stats of how many people have won from – the, the top seed percentage wise of all the all the tournaments or is it somebody that come up through the step ladder I think it'd have to be hard it's it's nice to be the tournament leader because the worst that can happen you're gonna finish second right but to actually get in game mode you know because you only had a couple shots now you got to get into game mode yeah I'm just going off the top of my head this year but it seems to be a little bit less than 500 for the top seeds winning in the step ladder I mean Walter Ray did it in Came out of the uh, second match in Clearwater, won, and then the following week in the PBA Nashville, he wasn't the top seed either, won that championship match. We need one of the, the gurus that, that <laughs> is knows all the stats, like Corey Kistner or Matt McNeil, that know all kinds of stats yeah. about bowling. They might know. So, well, it may be a coin flip. But even so, you can flip a coin ten times, and sometimes it comes up five for five, and yeah. sometimes it comes up three and seven. <laughs> and right now, Carlson two for two in an early ten-pin lead in this championship match. PBA 50, David Smalls, Jack's 60 Classic, presented by Track. He's pretty much lock and loaded. As long as he doesn't let his heart rate and his mind get ahead of him, that was... A little, I was going to say it was a little bit farther outside down lane than he's been playing, but it worked out for him. And it looked, I was going to say, that looks a little slow, <laughs> but apparently that's a combination he decided to go with on that shot. Yeah. E either that was the combination or that's just what happened at the foul line. That's what we call one of those foul line adjustments that he might have made. His yeah. eyes got as big as <laughs> golf balls on that shot. It's like, oh, Gary. Well, Kretz are getting a new piece of tape. Doesn't like the feel, and we know how important feel is to a player like Kretzer. Well, there's a lot of players. You take a look at Norm Duke. He's a feel player. Tape in, tape out, tape in, tape out. 
you got <laughs> if you don't have the right feel, it gets into your head. Right, but uh, so many of these players nowadays have gone to the interchangeable thumb. I don't see that with Kretzer. S I, uh, some guys just don't like the interchangeables. They don't want to take a chance on them breaking, you know. And they have broken in the past. You've seen uh, shows where. Uh, you know, a, a thumb has stayed on somebody's hand. But, sure. I mean, they've been perfected so well now. That doesn't happen hardly at all, if ever. But, you know, guys like molds. You know, some guys still do thumb molds. Uh, so they have a mold of their thumb, and they put that in. But, you know, in the moment, adrenaline gets going. Your thumb shrinks. It could swell. Nothing stays the same. And you, I get people come in the pro shop, and they go, I hate using tape. I hate, you know, just drill it this way. Well, Three weeks later, if the weather's changed, you could be swelling up. And if you bowl 15 more games than you normally bowl, your hand's different. You know, uh, you got to work this out a little bit. You have to, tape is your friend. It really is. You get used to adjusting thumb holes. Well, you saw that graphic. 2018 PBA 50 Cup, his lone PBA 50 Tour title to this point. And he's bounced back from that opening air and shot with a three-bagger right back in this match for Kretzer. Brian... He's got so many wrist tricks and hand tricks that he can make a ball do different things. You don't notice it here, you know, but whether he pulled his fingers out, buried one a little bit deeper, rotated his wrist, he can change the rotation of the ball so much. And that's what it takes. You've got to be adaptable out here. And so many people get locked into wanting to do one thing and thinking that's going to work. And... Not out here. Yeah, and you see some players sometimes they go to their wrist devices and such. Joel Carlson wearing something on his wrist, but it's not made to help him change or lock into a particular no, type of ball. That's ball. just a neoprene band around his wrist, which is really just, you know, it's keeping the tendons tight around okay. his wrist and giving him some warmth so it keeps him loose. You know, it, it's nothing about support as far as, you know, your wrist breaking back or making you actually hit the ball more or do anything like that. And some guys just you know, wear just athletic tape around the wrist. Carlson's other best finish other than the win in Hamilton Lanes earlier this year was sixth place in Mooresville. We could have a shootout this match going from two totally different angles. Carlson with a front five. And once again, that little bit farther right, but also the ball speed slowed down a bit again, Tom. I, you I talked said it earlier. I, yeah. I, I think... Joel's doing the right thing. He's keeping the ball in front of him. He, he's play, he's, and when you're giving the ball away as much as Brian is, you better be precise on release and speed and the whole nine yards. I mean, obviously there's a professional bowlers, and, and they're good at what they do. But still, if you can play the part of the lane that's giving you a little more area, <laughs> you want to play it. Kretzer found some area there because you don't exactly trip out a 4 9 unless you've got a little area at the break point. Watch that ball snap up. And we've never seen anybody on the match till this play this kind of angle. So he has a pretty pristine part of the lane available to him for the first 35 well, or so feet. As we said earlier, uh, I, I think with all the play that has been played where Joel's playing, that break point's opened up a little bit, and if he can get to it consistently, he's got a chance. But right now, Joel's perfect, and we got a 290 to 300 match if they go off the sheet, which would be pretty awesome. 22 to 7, and not so much. How about that? He didn't even see it. He walked back. The senior messenger. That was, one. <laughs> that, was, that was too Geritol and... Uh, it's like whatever hit that. That ball just landed. Those pins have to be have rounded bottoms. There's no they're way that brand, fell over. They're brand new <laughs> pins. They're less than a month old as well. Just happened to hit it with the fattest part of the pin. If you're going to get the slow whirl like that, you need to hit it with the middle of the <laughs> pin, and he did it. I mean, for Joel, that's got to be like, I got a break. Oh, no. no. Right. <laughs> Well, we know Joel can shoot big numbers in championship matches. Well, he's not scared. Obviously, he struck out against Ron Moore in Trenton, New Jersey, to tie him at 279 and then one in the roll-off. So the amount of strikes is not an issue. That's left. And the four doesn't go. You can just kind of see it didn't look real comfortable at release. Yeah, compared to what he's been playing, that ball was started up to the pocket a little bit. It was inside of 10 and it was more at the marker down lane instead of to the right. So 
his heart might, might be getting a little bit fast. Got to slow his mind down. Stay in the moment. Don't get anxious. And don't miss the single pin. Yeah. He missed the single pin earlier. And <laughs> you almost bl black catted him on that one. He almost missed that to the left. I don't think he heard me in the middle of his approach. I was just bringing up a fact from I, previous I, games. I don't know. I've seen him give you the evil eye. Okay. <laughs> well, he'll talk to me about it when it's done, I'm sure. So Carlson now finds himself down in the match by 11 if Kretzer can add another strike on in the seventh. Charlie's sitting over there, Charlie Tappel, sitting watching this match going, you know, I should have slowed it down. Much better shot. Half pocket mixer. And as you said, he didn't go left with it immediately like he did in that previous shot. No, that went down the lane and never got to the right. See, that was right of the marker down the lane. The other one, I, I think he just got a little quick on, and he, and he tugged it. You know, Obviously hoping for a little hold, which he got more than he expected. Now if Kretzer can strike here, he'll be up by 11. He's got that pin up, and it's actually over his middle finger. I don't know exactly what his axis is, but I would have to think that's got to be five a five-and-a-half-inch pin, which means for most players that's going to get down the lane a long ways before it turns over. I saw that ball start to turn over, and the first thing I thought was the nine pin may stand. And you watched that last pin to fall right there, and it was the nine pin. Mm -hmm. And so Kretzer up by 11 can extend it to 21 here in the eighth frame. The gentleman in the gray T-shirt that you're seeing, Sean Perry. He is our PBA lane man. He's the guy that you either love or hate at the end of each week. <laughs> Kretzer just missed the stepladder a couple events ago in the Dave Small Championship Lanes Classic, and he backed his way out of a roll-off to match playing the last event at Spectrum Lanes. And you know that's got to kind of have him burning a bit this week. I th honestly thought that shot had no chance of striking. It looked like he was going to leave the 4-7 and everything mixed. Again, we, we said it earlier. It's nicer when the pins lay on the deck and roll around and hit other pins. you got more chance of striking. You know, that, that fantasy of 10 back, that's fun to look at. But when you got round objects hitting round objects, something is going to fall <laughs> down. Hopefully. Carlson to stay within 11. Eighth frame. That shot was pure. I thought that was going to be a strike. And he took his time, really posted that shot. I don't think that six pin ever was more than a half inch away from the 10 all the way around. I mean, look how close that is that, all the way around. The only difference of that shot there compared to his others, he was more 9-10 at the arrows where the other ones are more 8-9. It was like a board off. And that's with this oil carrying down, that's how critical it is on the back end. You get it in just a little bit, the ball doesn't drive. He just kind of opened the door for Brian Kretzer on this shot. Kretzer going still at a 290 pace. Yeah, 21 pins the advantage for Kretzer getting in the ninth frame. Carlson, however, can still max out. 259. And that's going to force Kretzer to keep throwing marks on the board. Because if Kretzer suddenly goes open, open, things can happen. <laughs> Way better shot. That was a little bit farther right. Wasn't right on top of 10 at the arrows. And he knows that he, I think he knows he got that, pinched that one in just a little bit. And it's amazing, you know, we fight an invisible enemy that you can't even see, you know, out there. And your ball's your guy. And you got to read what's going on and make those adjustments. It's Brian Kretzer right now. If he can strike here in the ninth. And get the first one in the tenth. He'll lock up this title for his second career PBA 50 title. How about that? Dead flush. We are almost done with this one. On to the PBA 60. You know, I talked to a guy earlier. Uh, if it's ever on your bucket list, this is the only sport that you can come out, shoe him up, and bowl against the greatest bowlers in the world 
on the same pair of lanes in the same facility, bowl against them. It's not like a pro-am. You can actually pay to enter the tournament. So if you got a chance sometime, come out and bowl. 108 entries starting tomorrow for the PBA 60. Kretzer, this shot to lock it up. Ooh, a little slow with that. Got it a little bit quick right, a little slow. Comes in high, 3610. Spares 220, 247, 267. He needs this mark. And Joel Carlson needs to strike out. Kretzer, yeah, you want to make sure that feels real good on the spare ball right about now. Wait, he, and you can't miss this. There's take, well, I just took a look because when the pins got knocked around a little bit, there's a gap between that six and the ten right now. Take a look at that. It's a little wider space than it normally is, Tom. Between the 6-10, that, yeah. that is unfortunately very choppable. Across the lane. Oh, no. Wow. And it was all because that 6-pin got I, moved left. I am surprised he didn't ask for that because if the machine said it that way, he could have asked for a respot on that. Yeah, I didn't see whether it was a pin coming back across earlier or – the respot. So Carlson now needs a double to lock up this match. Double and seven is enough for Carlson. Well, he's been in this spot before, so uh, not too worried. Just take his time. We saw him get three strikes in a row to force a tie in New Jersey earlier this year, and then he struck in the roll-off. Right now, if he gets two and seven, he's going home with his second career PBA 50 Tour title. First one, dead there flush. There it is. I mean, Joel's almost getting to play his A game, just throwing it a little bit slower than he'd like to, but you know he's getting to play the part of the lane that he likes. All he's got to do is duplicate that shot. Don't get quick on this next shot. Give the ball a chance. Nothing more to say. Strike for the title. Brian's he's shaking his head going, Really? I just missed a 3-6-10? And you don't expect the caliber of player like Brian Kretzer to give you an open in the 10th frame. It was the same thing earlier this year in the kids' tour in Lubbock. Stu Williams opened the 10th frame. Jacob Buttruff took home a title when Jacob honestly didn't think he had a chance. For the title right here, dead flush. It's not done yet. No. He, he needs he, seven. So what do you do? Do you throw the high hard one down the middle to see if he gets seven, or you post it again? We've seen that get guys into trouble Yes, recently on the PBA tour. If I was him, I would actually take a little bit more time right now. and He's talking to himself a little bit right post now. Post this shot just like he did the previous yep. two. Kretzer doesn't want to watch, but he knows. Seven for the win. Seven. And he knew he, it. He knew it. There is your winner, Joel Carlson. Let's talk to the winner momentarily. Tom, thanks again for a great night in the booth. I'll see you next week. Title number two on the year. You had to shoot another huge number. You were 279 earlier in the year. Now you shoot 259. What's the key to shooting these big numbers in the championship matches? Apparently, I have to get a little behind before I can <laughs> win a game. I, you know, I love the soft patterns. I like it when the sky scores are high because mine are high too. And uh, what could be greater than this? Fans, everything. Did you think sitting there when Kretzer got up in the 10th frame that you would have a chance to do anything to win this match? I did not. I expected him to make the spare. I, I wish he would have made the spare. That's, that's no way to lose. We've all done it. Um, but they give you an opportunity like that. You have to take it. And now, two-time Titleist on the PBA 50 Tour. It's been a heck of a year, and only on a part-time basis, really. You had a few stops you couldn't get to with other commitments. Had to go are we, fishing. Are we, <laughs> had to go fishing. Are we going to get you for a few more stops next year with the success you've had this year? I will be uh, at the stops next year. I <laughs> won't be missing any. Uh, it's been an unbelievable season. I can't thank Dave Small enough. It's like 60 tournaments he's sponsored. Storm, Rotor Grip, 
Dell, thanks so much. Uh, turbo grips. Uh, it's my first tournament using finger grips. I think I like them. Thanks, Turbo. <laughs> so. Oh, you mentioned Dave Small. Let's bring his staff member here. Josh and Brady, his manager's here at Jack 60. And uh, you, I hope, I hope you're, uh, I hope you're a wine drinker. I'm a wine drinker. I love wine. Because that's a nice bottle of wine you've got in that trophy, going with you. And Josh, once again, thanks for hosting so far. And we've got another event coming up with PBA 60. We couldn't be happier. Uh, this has been a dream come true for me. My staff, Mr. Small, you guys did it. Joel, on behalf of everybody here at Jack 60, congratulations. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. There is your champion, Joel Carlson here at Dave Small's Jack 60 Lanes. We're not done here at Dave Small's place, so coming back tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern time, the Super Seniors take over. It's the Jack 60 PBA 60 National Championship. Join us at 4 p.m. Eastern for that first qualifying round tomorrow right here on Flow Bowling. Good night, everybody.